two. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Justin Schmitz, representing the city of Lone Tree, and I am the vice chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. I call to order the July 22nd, 2024 meeting at 1.30. This is an in-person live stream meeting format. Members of the public attending by Zoom have the ability to mute or unmute your, themselves and share their webcam. Those attending online, make sure that your type name reflects your first and last name and who you represent. We ask that those attending intending to speak use the raise hand button to ask a question or to make a comment on an agenda item. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the chat box. As a reminder to members and alternates here in person, please press the unmute button on the bottom of your mic stand and make sure the light on your microphone is on where you're prepared to speak and please speak directly into the microphone so your voice will amplify. Please announce your name and representation when asking a question or making a comment for the record. During the business meeting, TAC members and alternates can speak or ask questions. Uh, members of the public may speak during public comments. Dr. Cog uh, is sending around a sign-up sheet, so please sign in and make sure you're signed in. And at this time, uh, TAC members and alternates in person, I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourselves. So we will start uh, with Phil over here. Thanks. Lou Greenwald, City of Longmont, Boulder County. Jeff Boyd, Housing Special Interest Seat. Brian Weimer, Arapahoe County. Matt Callison, Arapahoe County, City of Aurora. Jeff Dankenbring, Arapahoe County, City of Centennial. Brent Soderland, Arapahoe County, City of Littleton. Kevin Ash, Town of Frederick, Weld County. Mike Whitaker, Jefferson County, and Wood. Christina Lane, Jefferson County. Maria DeAndre, City of Wheat Ridge, Jefferson County. Carson Priest, TDM Special Interest Seat. Lauren Curtis, Dr. Cog. Carolyn Clam, Dr. Cog. Here at Slater, City of Boulder, Boulder County. Alex Hyderite, Boulder County. I'm more Regional Air Quality Council. David Kretzinger, City of Denver. Bill Soroy, RTD. David Gasper, City and County of Denver. Jim Houston, Region C.4. Jordan Rudel, Department of Transportation, Region 1. Angie Rivera Malpieri, Equity Special Interest Seat. Ron Pepsdorf, Dr. Cog. Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog. Justin Schmitz, uh, City of Lone Tree, representing Douglas County. Cam Kennedy, Dr. Cog. Frank Bruno, via Mobility Services. As with that, I think we had introductions from everybody. Thank you all for being here. Did we miss anyone? Ah, Hillary Simmons with a little help, senior special interest. Great, thank you, Hillary. Um, at this time, I'm gonna kick it over uh, to Jacob, who is going to do some introductions and updates about members. Thank you, Vice Chair Schmitz. Um, one membership change to announce today. Uh, we need to say goodbye to Sean Poe with the City of Commerce City. Um, he's a member from the Adams County contingent. He's not here today, but this would have been his last meeting, so just wanted to take a moment um, to honor him and wish him well. All right, thank you very much. At this time, uh, we will now open the meeting for public comment. Please keep in mind public comment is limited to three minutes. If you've joined by Zoom, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you've joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we will call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Uh, staff will unmute you and then you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You'll have three minutes to speak, after which we will ask you to wrap up and your line will be muted. As a reminder, after a public comment period, only TAC members and alternates will partake in the discussion regarding each agenda item. And I will pause for a minute to see, uh, if, Cam, if we have any public comment, either online or in person. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
give it a moment, but I do not see any hands raised online or in person. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we will go ahead and close our public comment, and we will move on to Dr. Cog's staff, uh, to Ron Papp's board, some exciting announcements. Here. Um, just wanted to take an opportunity since you're all here and many of your jurisdictions have been uh, really significant and important partners in our climate planning work here at Dr. Cog. Many of you recall that we were uh, designated as the recipients and administrators of a $1 million EPA uh, climate uh, pollution reduction uh, planning grant. A uh, year ago or so now, actively busy, and that led to the creation of a priority action plan which led to a coalition led by um, our local partners and facilitated by Dr. Cog uh, preparing and submitting an implementation grant um, earlier this year. Uh, we just received news and there was a formal announcement this morning that Dr. Cog and its coalition members were awarded $199,700,000. Million, $199 million, for that program. I, I, Um, not, not directly related to transportation functions. Uh, it is really focused on a zero emissions building initiative for the region uh, in collaboration with our local government partners throughout, throughout the region, really focused on uh, uh, electrification of residential buildings with a focus on uh, grants to low income uh, communities and low income populations and residents, but also uh, rebate programs for available for residents throughout the region, as well as commercial commercial building electrification, energy efficiency retrofits, and so forth and so on. Uh, it's a five-year grant. Uh, we expect that to make huge impacts in our regions, helping the region achieve its goals to reduce carbon emissions throughout the regions. Super news, um, and um, uh, many of your jurisdictions, as I said, were deeply involved in that effort to get us to this point. So just want to express our thanks and appreciation for all of our partners throughout the region to get us to this point. We got a lot of work ahead of us, so buckle up. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Schmitz. Uh, a couple more announcements. I certainly can't top that, but a couple other things we wanted to announce. We have a new member of our transportation planning team, and I'd like to formally welcome Carolyn Clam, um, our new assistant planner. She comes to us from North Carolina. She's already noted the lack of humidity here in Colorado, um, but we're so glad to have Carolyn on the team. So welcome, Carolyn. And then I also wanted to know you, many of you may have realized in accessing the agenda materials this month, um, given House Bill 1110 accessibility requirements, um, continues to change the way that we do business and particularly regarding um, our committee agendas, and this is true not just for TAC, but um, our other committees and our board. Um, we are now posting um, the, committee, the committee agenda as a series of items on our website so that the agenda is an attachment, each individual agenda item is an attachment, and its, its attachments, I believe, are also separate attachments. And the reason for that has to do with remediation and the complication of assembling a large packet and trying to remediate that entire packet. Um, so we're now sort of remediating and posting um, items individually. So everything is still there as always, um, but just looks a little bit different. Um, you'll also continue to see some changes in our presentations and other materials, but just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jacob. That's really important uh, updates that we're all working through and I'm glad to see that happening. And congratulations uh, again to Dr. Cog staff and all of the staff that helped on that uh, very exciting grant opportunity. So we're all, like you said, Ron, lots of work ahead. And, and I think everybody's on board to help us get there. All right, we're gonna move on to our next item, which is our meeting summary from last meeting. Um, so this time we're gonna move to uh, review and approve our June 24th, 2024 TAC meeting summary. It was attachment A in your packet. Uh, if there's any discussion, corrections, or questions about the June 24th uh, TAC meeting, uh, please let us know. Seeing none, uh, we will go ahead and uh, move uh, to approve those minutes, uh, stand and approve them. We will now uh, move on to our action items, which on the agenda today, we have no, what's that? No action. Yep, no action items today. So we do not have any action items today. Um, and we will close that section and move directly uh, into our discussion items. Um, so each one of these items uh, will present our, introduce our presenter, 
and then allow everybody to ask us questions. Um, and Dr. Cog's staff has four exciting presentations for us today. And the first one, item number four, is the Northwest Rail Update, which is attachment B in your packet. And Cole Nieder, our se the senior transit planner from Dr. Cog, will be presenting. Good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Cole Nieder. I'm Dr. Cog's senior transit planner and also the staff representative on the Northwest Rail Peak Service Study. Uh, project and today RTD is uh, updating us on the study and providing also a primer uh, on the remaining activities for the project going forward. So this is going to include uh, finalizing the peak service uh, feasibility peak service feasibility study, uh, details on identified infrastructure requirements, and also uh, information on accessibility compliance. Um, for the project's pre uh, presentation, I'm going to hand it off to Patrick Stanley. He's the uh, engineering programs manager for RTD's capital programs. Uh, Good afternoon. Oops, sorry. Um, yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, committee members, thank you for having me here today. Um, this is the third time I'm presenting to Dr. Cog in a week, so I'd love to tell you I'm getting better at it, but no promises. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, my name is Patrick Stanley. Um, as Cole mentioned, I'm the uh, manager of engineering programs at RTD, and um, I serve as the project manager for the Northwest Rail Peak Service Feasibility Study. Before I kind of jump into the overview, what we're going to go through here, I wanted to kind of, if you focus on the map just a little bit, to give a little bit of a refresher about Northwest Rail Peak Service Study, what it's about, um, and uh, kind of go through the specifics a little bit of, of the corridor itself. So, um, in the RTD board asked, our, asked the RTD staff uh, to look at a Northwest Rail Peak Feasibility Study. Uh, Northwest Rail Peak Service consists of the concept for that consists of three trains in on the weekdays from Longmont to Denver, and then three return trips from Denver back to Longmont uh, weekend service. Uh, it would include six stations along the uh, BNSF portion of the corridor. What you see on the map here, there's a little section of solid green down on the bottom, uh, which is the B line, which opened up in 2016. Um, that is operated by our uh, concessionaire, Denver Transit Operators. It is an overhead electrified um, powered train, uh, just like the rest of our commuter rail services. The dash line that you see going up from uh, what is the, uh, the Westminster station, which is the terminus of the B line today, uh, all the way up to Lamont is a section of rail where we would actually run on the BNSF tracks. So that is something unique to RTD that we don't do that on any of the rest of our corridors. All right, so today we'll kind of uh, quickly go over the project status, uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the required infrastructure that we're going to need in order to run peak service, uh, specifically on the BNSF right away. Uh, some of the, we'll go over some of the common set of facts that we're trying to gather and finalize for this study. Uh, look at some of the opportunities that we see with maybe some of our potential partners, um, in particular the Front Range Passenger Rail District, um, and then talk a little bit about our recent community and stakeholder engagement. So real quick on the project status, our HDR consulting team, led by Mr. Rick Pilgrim right over there, um, is uh, working through our milestone three uh, uh, portion right now, and really kind of getting very close to concluding that. The study right now is set up into five milestones. Uh, milestones one and two were kind of information gathering milestones. Milestone three is what we call the base configuration. So that is essentially everything that is needed per the board's direction on what the peak service concept is, um, all the infrastructure that's needed and all the operational pieces associated with that. Um, they're also working on milestone four, making very good progress, uh, getting close to wrapping that up as well. Milestone four really looks at um, uh, st strategies and opportunities. Um, a lot of this is actually reflective of what we've heard from the public. It's not necessarily things that are in the, the mandate for what we're supposed to do for peak service, but it's things that we think um, that we've heard from the public that could make uh, the Northwest Rail um, a little bit more successful. Uh, and then finally, milestone five, uh, we're, we're also making good headway on there. That's really kind of the implementation um, ideas for, for how we can move forward on Northwest Rail. 
I wanted to touch a little bit on the Front Range Passenger Rail District. Um, right now, H&TB is working with the CDOT team uh, to do the um, uh, service development plan. Uh, that is a parallel effort um, that's ongoing at the same time that we're going through with our peak service plan. Um, sep they're separate projects, I would mention that, and they, they're parallel and we're talking to each other, trying to understand the facts of each other's study, but neither of the studies specifically is going to get to a joint operations answer per se, and I'll go over that a little bit, a little bit later. Um, so I wanted to just uh, mention that we've, we've been talking this whole time with Front Range Passenger Rail District, Andy Karzian and his team, uh, to try to understand where there's some opportunities uh, that we can, we can look at moving forward, um, take, taking this study as a foundational piece of information, move forward into discussions about what a potential joint operation might look like. Uh, so I mentioned six new stations. I uh, wanted to mention that basically uh, we're looking at um, you know, designing those stations as kind of a typical standard RTD station like you would see on the A line, the B line, or the G line right now commuter rail, uh, they would be level boarding. So we are looking at a high level platform uh, for the Northwest Rail Peak Service uh, Feasibility Study. Uh, this is unique. This is different than what we've looked at on any of our previous studies. And it really comes down to accessibility, which I'll touch on uh, in just a few more slides. Uh, th right now, th there are, uh, the concept with the BNSF um, is that we would actually secure a time window with, uh, to run those three peak uh, AM and three peak um, PM uh, uh, service trains. So the idea being that basically the BNSF will actually vacate the track, so to speak. They'll move all the trains either to a track siding or off the corridor during that time period so that we would have pri priority operations during that time period. In order to do that, we asked the BNSF what's it going to take in order for that to happen. And one of the things that came up are these passing sidings um, is what we're calling them. So. These are uh, sidings uh, that parallel the mainline track that allow the BNSF to actually move their train over into these sidings during those peak period windows. Um, on this particular project, we've, they've identified, uh, and we worked with them to, to find locations that have the minimal amount of impact to the community, um, but basically there's about seven, a little over seven miles of total uh, siding track. There's three separate uh, passing sidings on the corridor. Um, in the uh, in the uh, in the design. Uh, in addition, there's track improvements that need to be made. Uh, this is a freight track. Uh, we want to run at 79 miles an hour. The freight track is not necessarily set up for that speed uh, and for uh, passenger service. So there are things like curve smoothing, which is adjustment to some of the curves to allow for higher speed, uh, super elevation changes, uh, um, grade changes, etc. Uh, there's quite a few drainage upgrades along the corridor, especially where we have a uh, putting in another siding track. You can imagine we have to extend culverts and drainage ways and uh, drainage structures, um, as, as well as the fact that there are quite a few. This is an old rail rail corridor. There's a lot of drainage uh, infrastructure that maybe is not quite uh, what we would design today. So there's some things that we would need to improve to make sure that we uh, can have reliability on the system uh, for passenger rail service. 41 at grade crossings on the corridor. Uh, many of these have already been established as a quiet zone by the communities up in the area. And, uh, you know, kudos to them because that's not an easy thing to do. So that's, that's great that they've been able to do that. A number of them are still are in planning right now to be quiet zones. And then, of course, anywhere we, um, where we impact a crossing, uh, you know, we, we need to do safety improvements to make sure that it's a safe crossing based on PUC, uh, Public Utilities Commission diagnostics, um, as well as just an analysis of the crossing for pedestrian protection, car protection, those might be medians, gates, um, et cetera. Uh, there's a rail maintenance facility we're looking at in Longmont. Uh, the fleet that we would have for this corridor would be different than what we, our current commuter rail fleet. Our current commuter rail fleet is overhead electrified. So although you, I'm sure everybody here's seen it, but we have the overhead wires. We can't put that overhead wire system on this corridor because we have clearance issues on the BNSF tracks. And then uh, we're looking at a midday layover uh, location in uh, Westminster. Uh, so the midday layover is, you can imagine we've got three morning trains coming in and then they don't return back to Longmont until the evening. So we need to store those trains somewhere during the day.
So I wanted to touch a little bit on the high level boarding uh, for the platforms, um, why we're recommending this for the Northwest Rail. It is the most equitable solution. It's the most, it's the highest level accessibility that we can, we can accomplish. Um, it's, when I say equitable, it's not only equitable along the corridor, we have existing stations on the corridor itself already at Union Station, Pecos, 41st and Fox, and Westminster Station. Those are high level platforms. Um, so, um, you know, we don't want to necessarily change that that formula here. It's what's required by the FTA um, as far as level boarding. Um, again, we, we believe it's equal service, not like I was mentioned, not only just on the corridor itself, but also for the rest of the commuter rail system. Um, and, you know, having a train that's consistent with that could be an operational benefit potentially depending on, you know, any kind of circumstances that might come up, up in the future. Uh, that would require us to maybe interoperate with some with some trains. Um, operationally, uh, there are some low-level platforms. We we did look at kind of low low-level uh, trains versus high-level trains. And again, I think one of the major pieces is that the existing existing stations on the corridor are high-level already, uh, so they would have to be modified or changed to do low-level uh, boarding. The um, US will accommodate a low level um, on tracks four and five, but those are currently operated by Amtrak right now, and it could potentially interfere with front range passenger rail, uh, depending on what, depending on how they, uh, uh, how they want to operate their trains and their service. And we believe that the, uh, the Northwest rail should really operate on the same, same uh, platform at DUS as our current B line. So that kind of brings the question, you know, high-level platforms, high-level trains. Uh, we did look at some multi-level, uh, multi-level trains as well to see if that might work. Um, but just a few things to note: a low-level train is never going to work on a high-level platform. Um, so the four stations that we currently have on the line, you can imagine if you're low-level on the on the train, you open the doors and you're just going to run right into the platform edge. So that's that's not exactly a, a, a doable scenario. Uh, the mini high blocks like we have on our light rail that kind of gets you up to a high level train are really discouraged by the FTA. Um, in fact, they basically said that you can't do that unless unless your system, unless it's operationally infeasible uh, to not do level boarding. And what they've also said is cost is not an excuse for uh, operationally infeasible. So um, there are some disadvantages uh, that we noted for, for uh, multi-level trains, um, you know, they would require lifts or bridge plates or ramps uh, in order to get to all the various levels that you would need to get to. Um, the higher design, higher installation, op higher operating costs for RTD, um, and it's also a higher higher potential for failure, uh, realizing that, you know, we may strand somebody on a plane or on the train, have to get them to the next stop, bus them to where they need to go, et cetera. Um, we believe it's inferior. It's not. It's not equal uh, compared to level boarding. Um, it does add to. It potentially adds to dwell times significantly. Uh, right now, we're planning on about roughly 30, 35 second dwell time, uh, where the train stops, lets people off, lets people on, at each platform. And if you, you can imagine, if you had to deploy a ramp or a bridge plate or something like that, now you're talking minutes, and that starts to affect the overall. Uh, travel time uh, and uh, starts to affect the customers. Uh, some key considerations we, we wanted to get into when we were doing the peak service uh, feasibility study. I uh, wanted to look at the initial level of service that was pretty well defined for us by the board, um, what the operational requirements are, uh, what, what is the required infrastructure, what do we have to build out? Um, and one thing I should mention that I missed on and I apologize. In order to do the level boarding, this is kind of an important piece. Um, we actually have to do a what we we'll call a station siding um, at at the stations. The reason for that is that the BNSF requires eight foot six clear from the center line of their tracks to any obstructions, and RTD's boarding is we need to be within five foot four of the center line of track in order to close the gap between the train car and the platform. So basically, the BNSF clearance required is more than we can accommodate um, on our track. So in order to do that, we have to basically make a parallel piece of track um, that serves our stations directly. Um, we want to look at, you know, what are the costs to build the required infrastructure? 
Uh, we want to look at the, the, what it's going to cost to operate that initial level of service that we've identified. Uh, travel time analysis, you know, how long is it going to take? Uh, projected ridership and uh, the benefits and impacts of the service. I would say um, the peak service is focused on RTD. Um, I know there's a lot of conversations going on about um, Senate Bill 184, and I touched on it earlier that RTD and Front Range Passenger Rail District are both doing a parallel study. Right now, the reality is that each one of those studies individually is probably not going to be the solution that would come about if you truly did a joint operation. So that doesn't mean we're not talking. That doesn't mean we're not trying to identify, you know, potential solutions and efficiencies and uh, cost sharing type uh, strategies. Uh, capital costs, I want to touch on a little bit stations and accessibility compliance. We talked, I talked a little bit about that. That's the platforms, the, the parking, the plazas, uh, the, uh, the track sightings, uh, the track improvements, um, the, the passing sightings for the freight trains, as well as for the, um, again, for the, uh, the station sightings as well. And then uh, the acquisition of an easement from BNSF. Now, this, this is the one, one of the major pieces that we're actually waiting on from the BNSF right now. Um, we have gotten some good information from them, but this is basically a one-time real property um, agreement that essentially you buy, we're gonna buy track time from them is what the, what the concept is. So that peak period window, say it's three hours in the morning, three hours in the evening, we will basically pay a certain percentage of the track for a certain percentage of the day. So it's, it's a one-time long-term agreement. I kind of look at it as like it's it's how you get past the bouncer, it's how you get into the club, and then you have to buy the drinks uh, for the rest of the night. But um, so operating costs, uh, you know, what, what is it going to uh, cost to operate and maintain the trains and the stations? And then for train operations, um, RTD would prefer to operate it ourselves. We don't necessarily have a definitive answer from the BNSF uh, as of yet. If they would allow us to do that, it could possibly be operated. The train operators could be provided by the BNSF, they could be another third party um, operator as long as they meet the BNSF safety requirements. Dispatch would be by BNSF. Uh, one unique thing about this corridor is that since we have a BNSF controlled section of corridor and then our concessionaire DTO controls the section of the corridor, we actually would have two dispatchers and there would have to be a handoff somewhere along the corridor at, at, at actually at Westminster Station. Um, in order to do the dispatching and train movements. And then the uh, track maintenance would also be by BNSF and DTO for that section uh, where they operate. Um, also be looking at ridership projections. Impacts and benefits, uh, we are looking at environmental impacts. Uh, this is really a pre-NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. We're not doing a full NEPA study on this. This is more of a linkage document, um, taking this these pieces of information so that we can roll into a NEPA uh, process um, if the board um, decides to move forward on this project. We have looked at environmental justice and equity. Um, right now we're doing a Title VI for service planning and for the uh, uh, potential siting for a maintenance facility up in Longmont. We can't conclude that Title VI until we're really actually ready to start the operations. Um, but we are doing a preliminary so that we can identify any potential issues. Uh, look at land use impacts and TOD. Um, we want to really avoid any actions or scenarios or design that uh, limits the ability of front range passenger rail to also operate on the corridor. Um, and that's where a lot of our, our joint discussions come into play. Uh, public stakeholder identification of issues. And then some of the service, service characteristics we're looking at, you know, travel time. Uh, we have told, um, basically we've done a study early on uh, just to let people know that it's looking at about, we believe that we can do 65 minutes plus or minus two uh, on the corridor between Denver Union Station and Longmont. Uh, and then required infrastructure required for station, uh, you know, the station parking lots, uh, plazas, access, et cetera. So I want to touch a little bit real quick on opportunities. Obviously, many of you have probably heard about Front Range Passenger Rail District as well, and I've mentioned it a few times in this presentation. But again, they're separate projects on an overlapping route right now. And um, there's, there would be a few, we believe, shared stations. Um, so we're trying to make sure that we work 
through those issues and make a reasonable effort at this point to, to make sure that we can accommodate both services at those locations. Um, you can imagine um, if we were to share the track, um, there's a lot of economies of scale that might be possible. Um, you know, joint operations, efficiencies, potential synergies from uh, common fleet. Uh, if we were to purchase the, act the same uh, vehicle technology, you know, we could be more competitive um, on a purchase. Um, we could potentially share those vehicles as well, maybe even leading to a reduction of fleet uh, potentially. So um, it's possible to share and reduce operations and maintenance costs. You know, we, we could potentially do a joint uh, maintenance facility with the front range passenger rail as an example, um, as well as you know, jointly paying for the track uh, maintenance costs. Uh, potential to share track improvements costs, all this curve smoothing and the, uh, you know, the drainage infrastructure that I mentioned earlier, you know, there's the potential that we could split costs um, in some manner, whatever percentage that is with front range passenger rail. And then uh, potential to share in cost of safety systems and crossing upgrades. So positive train control, um, for those of you that were paying attention during the A and the G line, Testing, probably know a little bit about positive train control, but that's a, an overlay signal system um, that is required for, um, for passenger rail. I wanted to touch uh, real briefly on the community stakeholder engagement. Um, we had two quarter wide open houses. Uh, one was back in January and February of 2023, and our most recent one is uh, November 2023, uh, which we held in Longmont and Broomfield. We also had an, uh, a series of pop-up events at local community events. Um, we had about 14 of those with a total of uh, a little under 900 total visitors. Uh, we have a monthly study advisory team. Uh, we have a great uh, study advisory team that gives us input and, and keeps us on our toes and, and brings good things to us. We have a few members here today. One-on-one um, -on -one concept design meetings with the, uh, with the jurisdictions. And then we've had a few board committee updates. Um, we went to the uh, Finance and Planning Committee in April 2023, October 2023, and then we did a full board update, a uh, full board update in four. So just wanted to touch a little bit on the 2023 public meetings. Um, we had about 130 total attendees in person between those two events. Uh, the RTD study website comment form we received about a little under 800 or so comments. Uh, during the, that last uh, open house. And we also had a self-guided tour that we set up that um, had essentially the exact same content as what the public open house did. Uh, it was really meant to provide some flexibility for people to provide input without, you know, if they couldn't make it to the meeting. That ran for about 30 days or so. Um, on, on that self-guided online meeting, we've got about 6,000 views uh, total. Uh, with about 2,600 of those being an engaged view, meaning somebody actually went in and looked around and, you know, looked at maps or, you know, what, whatever that, uh, whatever was interesting to them at the time. Uh, and then we had about a little less than 400 total survey responses during that time. The November input that we got from the community was pretty similar to what we got in the January, February timeframe as well. Um, so we asked them a series of questions for their feedback, and I'm going to go through a few of those pretty quickly here. Um, one of them was, what do you see as the benefits of the peak rail service plan? Uh, pick three. Um, so really the biggest one that we saw was uh, a chance to reduce carbon footprint and live a little bit more environmental, uh, environmentally friendly lifestyle. Uh, next is really kind of getting to destination without worrying about traffic and snow, snow and weather conditions. Uh, and then um, kind of the next one was the uh, uh, really the relaxation, I guess I would call it maybe of a train, being able to kind of uh, multitask where you're actually out sitting on a train getting somewhere. Uh, the next one is what do you believe is your greatest barrier to ac accessing the station? Uh, the biggest one was really the missing sidewalk or uh, missing sidewalks and bike lanes, kind of how, how can somebody get there without a car? Uh, missing or, infre or infrequent bus service, and then uh, kind of rounding out the unsafe walking or biking conditions, followed by the lack of secure parking. Next question we asked is how can peak service be enhanced to better meet your needs and expectations? Um, and I would say that these are enhancements that, um, you know, really kind of deal with the fact that peak service uh, was always envisioned to be a bit of a starter service to get our foot in the door um, so that we can expand on it um, in the future. 
um, but it's really ad weekend service was the biggest one. And then uh, reverse commute is the other one. So rather than three trips in in the morning and that's it, might be another reverse commute some in the morning as an example in one in the evening. Uh, what concerns you the most about peak rail service? Um, and again, this is a similar theme as the previous question, but service only, um, well, the biggest one was the lack of weekend or evening service, uh, followed pretty closely by it only serves in one direction and limited hours. What is the most important element to include at or adjacent to future stations? This is a question we thought was good for us, so we thought it was also good for our stakeholder communities as well to kind of understand when they're looking at developing. Um, but really commercial and retail space to shop, uh, eat, grab coffee, et cetera, so the live, work, play uh, concept, and then housing within or biking distance to the, uh, to the station, and everything else is pretty even between safe and secure places to park, secure places for commuters to store their bike, and enhanced bike and pedestrian connections. So real quick, I want to touch on next steps. Um, we're, going to, we're going to continue the inventory of the cost for track Signing improvements, systems, crossing stations, and fleet. Uh, the BNSF, um, touch on this, we did actually hire the BNSF to do a 30% basic engineering set for us and, and cost estimates. Um, all the, the most recent um, estimates that we have done on, on the Northwest Rail did not have the benefit of actually having a cost directly from the BNSF. Um, we estimated those costs, so this is a, a nice step forward to actually get something that's a little bit more concrete. Um, we have actually received that 30% uh, since this uh, slide was, uh, since I sent it over to Cole, um, and we have those cost estimates as well. Uh, and that's just for the infrastructure. It doesn't, complete, it doesn't include the easement that I talked about early, earlier or the operations costs just yet. Um, so we want to complete those common set of facts, and this, this is important for us to understand moving forward. That's those BNSF costs for the easement track construction, RTD costs for station and maintenance storage facility construction, uh, fleet acquisition, the cost for that, operating and maintenance um, costs, and uh, ridership uh, projections. So we'll, uh, we're going to continue to evaluate um, implementation framework for Senate Bill 184. Um, for those of you that maybe are not familiar, that is a, is a bill that essentially requires a, uh, a partnership discussion between RTD, uh, CTIO, which is the Colorado Transportation Investment Office, um, Front Range Passenger Rail District, and CDOT. So uh, those conversations are ongoing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have two separate projects right now um, that are not necessarily the final solution that would come out of this 184 conversation, but they both inform it. Um, we see the peak service as a foundational piece of information that provides us with good data uh, to move into those conversations. Uh, continuing community and stakeholder engagement, um, you know, this really kind of focuses on, you know, continuing the conversation, continuing the discussion with the community um, for the rest of the peak service and after. Um, we don't want this to be something we put on the shelf and then just, you know, walk away from. And uh, there are a couple concept design things that we're working through with Louisville and Boulder. Um, I think we've got a good relation, working relationship with the staff as we kind of work through a few of those specifics, but um, nothing that we can't solve, just some things that we need to kind of um, uh, work on and, and refine as we move forward on, on the Northwest Rail. And with that, I'll... Sorry if I went a little long, I apologize. Um, I'll answer any questions that you may have. All right, well, thank you, RTD, for that very good presentation. Uh, we're now open up for questions um, that anyone may have for either RTD or Dr. Cog's staff. Yes, Angie. Thank you for the presentation. It was really good, and I read it over the weekend and thought, this is really great. So I just have a couple of questions. One is when I was looking at the survey and what was the most um, problematic thing for some folks, I couldn't help but think of wage workers. And that's probably why they want to know about frequency of trains in between. And I, um, so that's the first thing. And let me just give you the other two because they're pretty easy. Are you beginning to think about how much it will cost? to ride the train, because that'll be the second thing that wage workers and just folks would like to know. And then thirdly, because of gentrification, 
um, were the surveys and the opportunities to do input done in, in Spanish as well or other languages. Thank you. I'll maybe go in reverse order. The last one, yes, they were. Uh, we had uh, we actually had uh, Spanish and English documents as well as interpreters at the open houses for any questions there as well. Um, the um, the fair um, bill may kick me here if I say this incorrectly, uh, um, but it, right now you know since we got rid of the regional the regional fair um, you know the fair would be our base our base fair which I'm not sure exactly what the number is right now Bill but I don't believe that we are anticipating a different fare for this for this service at this time sure um yeah, you can yeah it, 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 but my expectation would it be it would be similar to what you know the the fares are for older or existing which would be 275 each way subject to future fare studies that could happen <laughs> before this open thank you bill um and then I remind me of the first question. I, I apologize. Oh, yeah, that is true. That is somebody that we heard from, um, you know, shift workers in particular, somebody that maybe is in hospitality. Uh, students in general uh, was an interesting one from, from Boulder. So what we're doing is we're taking the input that we heard from the folks and are really kind of looking at, is there a way that we could do reverse, some reverse commute um, in those peak period windows? Uh, kind of focusing on trying to get it within that agreement framework that we're we're trying to set up with the BNSF. Um, it does look like it may be possible, um, but I would state that there are implications with that. There's higher higher operations costs and some of the things that go along with it, as well as some additional infrastructure, because whenever you do that reverse commute, it's a single track right now. We're going to have to have a pass somewhere, so we'll have to build some additional track probably to do that. Um, so just to reiterate, the peak service is not necessarily considering those as part of its base configuration, but we do we did want to look at those and understand, you know, how much further of a jump would it be to potentially include some of those some of those um, those other concepts. Thank you very much, uh, David Kruntzinger. Um Patrick, I, thank you for the presentation as well. I appreciated it. Um, I noticed in your shared stations map that the front range passenger rail has stations about every 10 to 15 miles. So it looks like there's one that would be missing or there's a gap at about uh, downtown Westminster. What would it take um, an additional track or other infrastructure to accommodate one more shared station? Sure. Um, and I would say I'll preface this that, that that's uh, the front range passenger rail effort to try to figure out where their stations are going to be. Um, we, we, we think we're pretty pretty sure on a couple of them. Um, we have taken a rather quick look, but we did take a look at kind of all the station locations, and we do believe that we can um, accommodate that on on the alignment. Uh, we basically essentially what it is, you know, we have a 400 foot long platform is what we're looking at, and Front Range Passenger Rail District has told us they're looking at more like 700 ish. Uh, plus or minus, I think that's still something to be determined, but that's kind of what we've looked at is do, does, does the track geometry and the location potentially allow for a longer platform? And uh, in general, we think it we think it does. Um, obviously, there'd be some tweaks here and there, but um, it does look like we could accommodate it at most of those stations. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? On Pastorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Patrick, thanks again. I think this is my third time seeing your presentation. Appreciate you bearing with us and doing this. Obviously, I have a lot of groups that are very interested in this. Uh, and I think of a new question every time I see your presentation. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of interest in, and I certainly appreciate RTD's efforts to work with the Front Range Passenger Rail District to explore opportunities to sort of leverage the leverage potential um, for sort of shared investments in the corridor uh, to maximize efficiency of expenditures. I am curious about what your current thought process is in terms of the timing, um, because it's probably, probably fair to think that the projects aren't going to run 100% concurrently and be ready to proceed at exactly the same pace in time. And so how far along are conversations or what might the conversations look like in terms of negotiating one easement 
um, agreement with BNSF that could apply to both entities, depending on which one's ahead and what sort of cost sharing arrangements might um, be included between the different. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Um, you're correct that they are on different schedules. Um, we, I would say in general, we know and have known for a while a little bit more about what our operations and what our uh, scenario would be with the BNSF um, than the Front Range Passenger Rail District. Um, they're still working through their STP right now, and I think some of that service definition is part of that. Um, so at this stage, we are we are trying our best to share information as soon as we, we get it between the two parties. Um, I, the SB 184 uh, definitely speeds things up. And in fact, I think our first presentation, which I believe is being um, uh, the FRPRD is actually taking a lead on is September 30th. And it is interesting because we're basically in a little bit of a parallel uh, parallel effort where we're trying to close out and finish ours while still trying to inform um, that, that broader conversation. It's, it's exciting times really uh, to think about uh, some of those potentials. But, you know, one of the key things for us is we want to try to finish up the peak service study so that we have that that basis and that foundation that we can bring into those further conversations. Um, so uh, as far as timing of, you know, we have started talking specifically about 184. Uh, we've met with the state facilitator um, and gone through kind of some of the important pieces for RTD um, as far as the joint operations piece um, uh, for, for us uh, to, meet, to meet our customers' needs. And then um, I know that's happened as well for FRPRD and CDOT and, and probably CTIO and at our project level and probably an executive level. So there's a whole lot of whole lot of chatter going on right now. Um, and I think one of the one of the big next steps is to kind of pull all those um, kind of needs, I guess I would maybe call it for each one of the broader discussion between all the parties and, and figure out how we can you know, uh, meet as many of those as we can uh, with the joint operations. I don't, I can't tell you right now exactly what a joint operation is going to look like. Um, I can tell you, you know, I think securing a peak period window for, for uh, uh, the peak service may not necessarily be the same concept for a joint operations. Um, and the reason I say that is that um, the NSF has to do their operations sometime. And um, if we if we secure those windows, they're going to have to do it midday or before and after those peak period times. And if we're running additional passenger rail service during those times, it kind of changes that picture a little bit. And that's just one example. Um, so I think really, truly taking all this information, finalizing this report, having them finalize their SDP um, is really going to inform, I think, what those conversations are moving forward. Um, but that still doesn't alleviate the fact that we have to have some of those conversations right now, but even before we're completely done. So hopefully I answered your question. I kind of rambled a little bit, but. Thank you. Uh, one, any other questions or comments on this item? All right, see none. Uh, thank you very much to RTD staff for presenting this today, and thank you very much. Yeah. I'll leave this up or? I can go to the next one if there's one there. We we'll move on to our next item, which is item number five, an update on the livable centers, small area planning set aside. This is attachment C in your packet. And making the presentation will be Caitlin Service, Senior Planner, Regional Planning and Plan Implementation. Hello, good afternoon. I'm a senior with Dr. Cog's Regional Development Department. I'm to be here 
working? Everyone hear me in the back? Good? Okay. Yep, that's great. Okay, perfect. I am excited to be here today to share the Livable Centers set aside with everyone. Our current TIP identifies $2.5 million for the Livable Centers set aside. About half of that will be available for this application cycle uh, that we're kicking off this summer. The funding is for consultant services for planning efforts to plan for small area plans that focus on livability and multimodal centers. So uh, more on that in a moment, but last note I wanna make on this slide is that the policies for the set aside were reviewed by this committee in spring of 2023 and adopted formally by the board in 2023 and that full document is linked in your packet for more details. The Livable Centers program is rooted in the Metro vision, the region's plan for growth and development, also rooted in Dr. Cog's vision for the region. So the program aims to have a nice integration of concepts between uh, employment, housing, transportation, and land use, kind of all working together to work towards those shared regional goals and enhancing quality of life in the Denver region. The program will fund planning consultant services for projects that support regional centers and nodes along the region's multimodal transportation corridors. So as you think about your own community, think about how a planning effort might be useful to support your community, enhancing centers that are transit, pedestrian, bicycle friendly, um, something that fosters a diverse mix of land uses, plans for a wide range of housing, employment and services, enhances public gathering spaces, reduces greenhouse gas emissions, and supports existing neighborhoods. Of project types that can be eligible for this type of program. Um, oops. Uh, some examples are here up on the screen and also included in your packet. Deliverables could look like analyses, plans, public engagement reports, um, land use code guidance, development plans that identify barriers to housing, identifying public infrastructure improvements, prioritizing near and long-term investments. Um, so it's meant to be you know, wide range and flexible. We wanna hear from you what type of planning effort or analyses would be most useful in enhancing livability in the centers of your community. Um, and so we're, we're excited to get a wide range of proposals on that. Just one note of a couple things that it's not meant to support. Um, the program's not meant to support projects through design and engineering phases or working towards environmental clearances. Bill 1313, this is the transit oriented communities bill um, that was passed during the most recent legislative session. Most have probably heard of it by now. If you're not familiar, encourage you to reach out to DOLA for more resources or find me after the meeting um, and I'll connect you with someone from DOLA. DOLA is responsible for administering and implementing um, this legislation and all of its requirements. But um, at Dr. Cog, we wanna acknowledge that most of our municipalities are operating within um, these new requirements. And we do see some alignments along the types of activities that municipalities will be doing in order to align with the requirements of this bill and some of the goals of this Livable Centers program. So if you see that alignment in your community, you're working on something, you know, housing, your transit, and you feel like that uh, planning effort also aligns with these program goals and meets into these requirements, we'd be very interested um, to see your letter of intent come through this process. Project location. So the location is a really key component of this program. Um, you saw before the project type list is flexible and wide ranging. Even the term livability is quite wide ranging, uh, but the centers is a key component of uh, the projects that this program can support. So we are looking for a center or node on the region's transportation system. So really think geographically about where that is in your community. And just note that this is not meant to be like a citywide plan or a parcel level site planning effort. This is meant to be um, for that center or node on your regional multimodal transportation system. Um, also, additional note, um, due to the funding source, the project does need to be in the MPO boundary.
So there are a lot of different concepts that fall into the livable centers definition. Um, and you can see that uh, we added some of the key terms on here that are often you might talk about, use these words to talk about livable centers in your own community, or you might hear um, them from other places. But we just wanted to clarify, this is not a designation in Metro Vision. There's not a specific qualifying criteria for your center to be eligible for this type of project. Um, it's we mean it to be an umbrella term to capture that type of concept, but there's not any specific process you need to go through, um, like urban centers or anything to be eligible participants. Um, you can see here on the screen, county and municipal governments, regional agencies, TMAs, nonprofits that are serving a regional transportation purpose and state of Colorado offices and agencies. Program logistics, again, this is for consulting services, for planning analysis. We'll have $1.25 million this application cycle. We will have another application cycle either in late 2025 or early 2026 um, to tackle the remaining 1.25 million. There is no match required for this. Thank you to um, some cooperation and support from CDOT. Um, Dr. Cog will fully fund this uh, through that effort and through that partnership with CDOT. We will act as the project managers, um, managing procurement, all that administrative, uh, those administrative tasks that sometimes come with this type of funding. Um, we'll take that off your plate. We just want to support the efforts however we can. Uh, what we ask from the project sponsor uh, through the letter of interest process will also be um, kind of a commitment or acknowledgement of buy-in from the project sponsor. So um, someone who has authority to commit staff time would sign a letter of understanding and project commitment. Um, and we just kind of want to make sure that we're aligned in expectations on wanting to be in partnership with municipal staff or project sponsor staff, um, that we're in close communication, reviewing deliverables, getting feedback. Um, you're acting as the project liaison between the project and your elected officials. Um, this to be like a close partnership and we want it to have, be something that really has buy-in from the project sponsors that when the plan is created, it's not just the PDF, that it has uh, some, some buy-in from the project sponsor to move forward and progress into it. That's really in a nutshell what we're looking for from, from that. Some key dates up here, I encourage you, or um, if you want to pass this along to colleagues, to join us for an informational webinar on August 14th. There's been some e-blasts on that. It is on the Dr. Cog website, and additionally, it's linked in the packet materials as well, so the registration for that webinar is open. Um, so there'll be more in-depth information on that. Um, August 14th is also the date that our letters of interest uh, solicitation will go up online. And um, after we go through procurement and all the administrative uh, tasks that lead up to the project kickoff, we're looking around May of 2025 to kick off these projects. So again, full uh, tip policy document is linked in your packet materials and available on the Dr. Cog website. And please join us on August 14th for the webinar. And happy to answer any questions or uh, feel free. Thank you, Caitlin, for that update and exciting project. It's always good to see projects that uh, do not require a local match. So I think a lot of interest will be coming on these projects. Um, with that, any questions on this item? Brian Weimer. Thank you for your presentation. I'm gonna ask this difficult question. And that is um, with the relationship between Dr. Cog's staff and the local agency. Um, how do you see decisions being made particularly if there's maybe different views of that? I mean, how how is that gonna work? Yeah, um, I, that sounds like a question that's specific per project, um, but we do want this to be a, a partnership between Dr. Cog and the local agency. Um, and again, these funds are for planning efforts. So the result will be a document, a PDF, an analysis, some sort of paper thing that will take staff to fully implement into the community. So we want to be kind of aligned on what is feasible within, let's say, the, the political context or decision maker context within your community. Um, and I'll 
all work together on that. Ultimately, is staff of the local community that will bring the project into fruition. Um, I think through the letter of interest process and just the scoping process with the consultant would be a great time for Dr. Cog staff and the local agency staff to be aligned on kind of what we're both looking for out of the plan. That's the most specific, without knowing more specifics of what you're thinking of or kind of what the situation would be, that's the best answer I can kind of give on that one. And I think Ron has an additional comment on that. Elon did great. It's, <laughs> exact, it's exactly correct. I'll just, I'll just take the opportunity to expand a little bit. The only reason really, not the only reason, the primary reason that we're sort of becoming the grant funds and managing this program is to facilitate a more efficient contracting process for these relatively small grants and because CDOT very graciously agreed to allow us to tap into some state toll credits to match these funds, which is how we're able to on this program with uh, with no uh, local match for these federal funds. Just like MetroVision, which is sort of where this program is rooted in, which acknowledges that we have broad regional objectives and broad regional goals, and that there are very unique and different ways to achieve those goals depending on local context. So the intent here is not for Dr. Cog to take over local decision making or come up with the plan. This is very much a collaborative and cooperative effort with local jurisdictions. Dr. Cog has some expertise and we know what the context is for sort of these small area plans as discussed in MetroVision. But our intent is very much for the local agency partners that work with us on these projects to come up with the appropriate and correct sort of local plan through this work, again, within the MetroVision context. Ellen, you were exactly right. right. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, you know, since we're talking potentially 1313 legislation and how that would fit into that, it does become kind of a local decision-making process. And where does that fall relative to this? And I think you adequately explained that. I think that, that is where kind of the discussion comes from, right? And you can see those issues coming up depending on where the community is and what that might look like. So thank you. Thank you, Brian. Other questions or comments? See none, thank you very much, Caitlin, for that presentation. Our next presentation is item number six. An update on the innovative mobility set aside. This is attachment D in your packet. And Emily Lindsay, program manager, active and emerging mobility, uh, will be making the presentation. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Emily Lindsay. I manage our Active and Emerging Mobility Program. I'm in our Transportation Planning and Operations Division. Super nice to see some friendly faces, some new faces. Um, I'm here to talk with you all about the Innovative Mobility Set-Aside. So it's another set-aside program um, offered by Dr. Cog. And this was really uh, established uh, to support preparedness and planning. Um, of innovative mobility solutions throughout the Denver region. Um, some of the goals around this set aside uh, really are focused on exploring things together, demonstrating um, planning for kind of new and emerging mobility solutions, whether that is piloting or planning or doing some analysis um, around the, the t topics and themes that I'm gonna cover in, in a few slides. Um, that is kind of up to our partner agencies uh, I think, again, this is an opportunity to invest in collaborative learning. I think some of the innovative mobility topics have not been tackled across the region yet. Um, so for certain communities or organizations that kind of want to jump in, we have an opportunity uh, to, to lead our peers um, in this space. So 
I did not know where this was going to fall when I made this slide. <laughs> this is very similar to the set aside that Caitlin just presented on, but is different than our typical Dr. Cog set asides in the sense that Dr. Cog will retain funding um, for the projects that are awarded through this set aside process. Um, and so it, it is a little bit leads more on the technical assistance planning feasibility side um, than our, our typical transportation planning and operation um, like project specific set asides. And so we will work really closely with any of the project partners that are awarded um, and Dr. Cog will directly contract with vendors or consultants as we to implement the project. Um, so partner agencies that submit a letter of interest will not directly receive funds. Dr. Cog will retain those. Um, and there is also no required match. We have $4 million for the innovative mobility set aside over the four year tip um, program. So from 24 to 27, approximately a million dollars a year. And our first call for projects uh, will be for $2 million. Uh, there is, like I mentioned, no local match required. It follows a very similar model to how that's funded um, and matched with toll credits um, through generous partnership with CDOT. As far as eligible, you can see the list here. It's pretty comprehensive. We do ask that non-governmental organizations um, have their support of a local government if they're doing a project in that area. Uh, that, again, is pretty standard across Dr. Cog's set asides, and we've done that in the past. So innovative mobility is, it is a loaded term and probably means different things to every single one of us. Um, so I wanted to highlight some of the kinds of projects that are eligible. Again, this being a new set aside, I think we're open to learning from you all about your interest in this space as well. Um, but just wanted to highlight planning, preparedness, feasibility for projects, whether it's connected automated vehicles, curbside management, emerging modes, mobility as a service, mobility data, mobility hubs, electrification, shared mobility. Those are some of the topics. <laughs> this is not meant to be an exhaustive list. Um, and we certainly want to work with folks. Uh, based on their own local interests in the innovative mobility space. Like I mentioned, I think this means a lot of different things to, to each of us. So I did want to highlight a couple different project examples. Really, I think the range of, uh, of focus depends on the, on the local project sponsor um, in what they specifically want to work with, but that might look like a connected work zone pilot. So uh, it might look like mobility hub planning, it might look at uh, mobility on demand kind of feasibility or study. Um, and yeah, it can, it can mean a range of different things, right? And we've gotten this question a lot, I think right when the TIP policy was adopted, you know, how does the private sector get involved? I think typically they do play a role in the innovative mobility space as vendors or operators. Um, and we did wanna highlight that private for-profit companies, they're not eligible to submit a letter of interest, right? This is really locally driven um, by our, our partners, but they will be able to respond to RFPs or RFQs associated with the selected project. So they really don't come in to the mix until later, once we have awarded and selected projects. I'm not gonna go through this because Caitlin <laughs> really covered it well, but I think it's very similar in the nature that Dr. Cog full, uh, fully funds and manages the project. We do all of the administrative stuff. Um, to manage the project and select either vendors or contractors. Um, and then the partner, depending on the project and their level of interest, uh, really helps us kind of manage that project side by side, be partners in the development of whatever the project might look like. Um, and then all the rest of the tests are listed right here. But I think just making sure that, that we can use this planning uh, feasibility or analysis project to inform future projects or decision making. All right, so the application process, again, is very similar. Uh, we do plan to have a webinar um, in August, hopefully. Uh, folks are welcome always to reach out to Dr. Cog's staff if you know us, this is, this is an open call. Um, and then we will be soliciting letters of interest. So a, that like really short form application process where we'll ask about the project concept, an estimated budget, um, and then we will go through and score these projects uh, the proposed list of projects for funding will go through our typical committee approval process, TAC, RTC, and the board. So you all will, will hear about this again soon. Um, and then selected project partners uh, will be notified after board approval and we will work together to develop a scope schedule um, and next steps. 
So like I mentioned, we are still working on some administrative details around the timeline. So we will share that information by email and things will be posted on the innovative mobility uh, page at drcog.org. Um, so rest assured, there's more info coming, but we wanted to give you all a heads up uh, so that you can all think about some ideas, uh, reach out, but just be ready for the announcement of that webinar later this summer. That is all from me, but I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you, Emily, and always exciting to hear about these set-asides and uh, always a great opportunity, I think, for local agencies to find some creative ways uh, to put innovation, especially in this process, into all uh, jurisdictions. Uh, with that, um, any questions or comments uh, for Emily? I think they already may have asked Caitlin, so. Wonderful, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Emily. Um, and our last uh, discussion item for the day uh, will be uh, item number seven, uh, regional bus rapid transit update. This is attachment E in your packet. And Jacob Rager, a multimodal transportation planning manager, uh, will be presenting. All right, thank you, Vice Chair Schmitz. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we talked about trains earlier. Let's talk about bus rapid transit. We wanted to give you an update on um, regional efforts around bus rapid transit in uh, the greater Denver region um, involving multiple agencies and multiple projects. Um, I'm gonna start first with the Flatiron Flyer. Um, I talked about accessibility requirements earlier, so I do wanna be transparent about some of the slides in this presentation, including this one. Um, this is content from RTD, so I am gonna present another agency's content, um, but per House Bill 1110 accessibility requirements, when we fold another agency's content into our presentation, we actually have to put it into our template, our presentation, so that we can remediate the entire presentation. So I feel a little weird presenting about RTD's information, but since staff is here, they're welcome to correct me if I get it wrong. Um, but what I would say about this slide is that our BRT story in this region really started back in 2016 with the Flatiron Flyer. Um, it was kind of our first real BRT investment um, in this region. Um, you all are very familiar with it, and you know that um, it included some of those hallmarks of what we expect to see in bus rapid transit service, right? We always say, well, what is BRT? What makes BRT? So it is things like frequent service lanes, bus on shoulder, off-board fare collection, transit signal priority. Um, so this was the first service that really incorporated some of those BRT type elements into this, into this service. So that was back in 2016. Um, and then as many of you know, because you participated in it, um, RTD completed the regional BRT feasibility study um, back in 2019. This was a really comprehensive study that looked at, I think around 40 corridors across the region, a really comprehensive look at all of the potential corridors, how they would rate for bus rapid transit, um, looking at their readiness, looking at their ridership, their feasibility, their competitiveness for funding, um, you know, sorted through several levels of, of kind of that analysis and ended up identifying the eight corridors that you see here. Um, and as it turns out, most of these eight corridors should look very familiar um, because those many of these corridors are the ones that we carried forward um, into subsequent BRT planning work, which then led to our 2050 regional transportation plan um, and our own two-year planning process that dealt with no transportation plan, but also included kind of some refinements and additional work on um, those bus rapid transit recommendations and the bus rapid transit network. So we ended up in the 2050 regional transportation plan that was adopted in 2021 with these 11 specific distinct BRT corridors that you see listed um, and mapped on this slide, which again, um, not completely, but pretty closely match kind of those corridors from the BRT uh, feasibility study. Um, then in 2022, as many of you know, we updated the regional transportation plan to respond to um, the state's transportation greenhouse gas planning rule. Uh, we demonstrate compliance in this region through our regional transportation plan. And one of the things that we did was actually advance some of the BRT corridors to get them done sooner um, to capture the greenhouse gas benefits of those projects and really this program, this network of, of BRT across the region. Um, so as you can see, it's a very assertive, even aggressive 
um, kind of commitment to BRT that we've made together as a region, 11 corridors in the plan, five of them by 2030, another five by 2040, and the remaining by 2050. So there's a lot on our collective plate that we've committed to in terms of implementing bus rapid transit um, here in the next several years. Although as important as it is, the bus, tra bus rapid transit network is part of a larger sort of fixed guideway rapid transit network that we're building in this region. Obviously, some of which we've already talked about today, Northwest Rail, Front Range Passenger Rail, RTD's existing and future uh, light rail commuter rail system, uh, some of the elements that are listed here. Um, again, the BRT network, as important as it is to connect to itself and, and those other corridors, it's also very important to connect to that larger fixed guideway transit network that we're building within this region and even beyond this region. So the network, of course, is really important. Um, as I've said, it's an important investment priority within the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Already talked a little bit about the greenhouse gas rule. Um, again, to put a finer point on that, um, through the state's greenhouse gas transportation planning standard, both Dr. Cog and CDOT, as well as eventually the other MPOs in the state, the Metropolitan Planning Organizations, are subject to that rule. But within the geography of this region, of the Dr. Cog Metropolitan Planning Organization region, which is essentially the map I showed you a couple slides ago, we are responsible through the 2050 RTP to demonstrate compliance with the greenhouse gas planning standard through our plan. So the BRT network is a really important component, right, to help us do that over time. Um, also important for air quality conformity, um, the implementation is why this network is important, right? Multimodal network, mobility, equity, safety, um, all of those reasons to carry forward with this network. And it's not just from a Dr. Cog perspective, uh, right? Elements of this network are in CDOT's 10-year plan, um, their statewide plan, Denver moves everyone, other plans that include appropriate elements or applicable elements of the BRT network um, across the region. So that's the network, but in terms of the partnership, uh, which I'll talk more about in the next couple slides, it's really a multi-agency planning, funding, and implementation collaborative, right? Where several agencies have come together to help carry this, this momentous work and tremendous amount of work forward um, in the region. We do think it's unique. Um, we think it might be the only sort of multi-agency partnership of its type in the country uh, working on BRT. There are other regions that are really active in implementing bus rapid transit, Seattle, the Twin Cities, Indianapolis, and others. Um, but we're not aware of another partnership kind of quite like ours that's a voluntary collaboration of multiple agencies coming together to do this work. So if you remember only one thing I tell you today, it's this next bullet point. This is a foundational aspect for us. The foundation of the partnership is that it's more work, especially by 20 lifetime of the plan than any single agency can lead or do alone, right? We have to come together. This has to be a multi-agency partnership in order to accomplish what's been laid out in terms of that aggressive commitment to be our team. This is a voluntary partnership and participation. Again, part of what makes it unique, but I think part of what also um, makes it exciting in terms of the work that we've, um, that we've agreed to do. Um, so in a nutshell, of course, the partnership is here to collaborate and assist multiple BRT corridors simultaneously, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, so who's in this mysterious regional BRT partnership? Um, here are the logos of the agencies involved. We were pretty intentional about setting up, and I say the royal we, um, all of us, and setting up this partnership um, to include those regional and state agencies that could take kind of that multi-project, multi-corridor sort of perspective. We recognize and appreciate the fact that the regional BRT network that I've shown you touches about, give or take, 20 jurisdictions across our region. There are many hands involved in the work, and I want to be clear about that. But in terms of guiding the overall strategic kind of effort of the work from that regional perspective, um, it's really the agencies that you see here. The Colorado Department of Transportation, the City and County of Denver, Dr. Cog, RTD, the City of Aurora, um, and Boulder, sort of the Colorado 119 coalition, um, actually represented through the city of, of Boulder, Boulder County. Um, so it's those folks kind of coming together um, to set the strategic vision um, and to do the holistic work on the partnership. Um, but obviously, of course, we're working through the partnership and through the projects with multiple jurisdictions to carry this work forward. So a little bit about the nuts and bolts of the partnership. Again, really sort of a kind of a mission statement here. Our goal is to accelerate project development and implementation for multiple BRT corridors simultaneously, leveraging resources and efficiencies, right? 
We've got 11 sort of separate projects. We don't want to do them as 11 separate projects. We want to find those economies of scale. We want to share those resources. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We don't want these projects to compete with each other, right? We want to look at this more strategically. And so in particular, we've been kind of working in three areas in the partnership, um, and we've been meeting together for close, I think, to a year and a half, kind of working on some of these substantive technical issues. Um, the first is costs and funding, kind of updating the costs and the work that was done in the regional BRT feasibility study and in the 2050 RTP um, to update those quarter level, those project level cost estimates, um, and also develop a holistic strategic funding strategy for these corridors, again, so that we're not competing with ourselves, we're not competing with each other. Can we be more strategic about going after the opportunities that exist, at least right now, um, at the federal level, through the state level, and through other funding sources. So that's been a big component of the work. Um, design standards, you know, sort of I said earlier, um, well, what is BRT, right? Well, we'll know when we see it. How do we define BRT? So kind of working through what are those components and elements of BRT? What does a system look like that crosses those 20 jurisdictions within our region? What are we building together through these multiple projects to create that region-wide system? But also recognizing each corridor, each roadway, each project is just a little bit different. And so sorting through, you know, what is important at that system level and at that corridor level in terms of some of those components and elements and design standards of BRT. And then finally, the partnership itself, right? This is, um, I think the word is, is nascent, um, sort of a you know embryonic evolving partnership. How should the partnership continue to evolve over time? What do we need to do at the partnership level to support these different projects, um, to think strategically? different jurisdictions and stakeholders. You know, what do we need in terms of our own sort of tools in our toolbox um, to help the partnership thrive and grow and evolve over time as we get further into these projects? Um, so those are three areas in particular um, that we've been working through at the partnership level. Uh, we've also been pursuing federal grants and potential consultant assistance. Something we're working on now um, is the idea of can we bring um, some funding, some resources to the table um, to help our work at the partnership and ultimately, obviously, to help the work within the region. So really sort of the tagline of building a regional network and system, not 11 uh, individual projects. Um, this is a table with a lot of information that basically shows the current status of all 11 designated BRT corridors within the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. I'm not going to go through these individually, but I do want to point out a couple things. First is that these corridors really span the spectrum of where they are in the planning and project development process. Two of these corridors, East Colfax and Colorado 119, um, are getting close to construction or will soon be getting close to construction. Some of these corridors have had some initial planning work done. Uh, federal Boulevard BRT that I'll talk about in a minute is in the uh, federal project development process. Uh, some of these corridors have had initial maybe sort of first steps corridor studies. Um, at least a couple of these corridors, frankly, are lines on a map where not much has been done yet talking about sort of 11 different, you know, projects, 11 different kind of statuses of these different projects and kind of working through those together um, on the one hand. On the other hand, what I want to point out is sort of the alphabet soup, the acronyms of the agencies that are actually taking the lead and are involved. Remember I said that no single agency can lead or do this work alone. So I think this really does sort of embody and demonstrate the partnership that multiple agencies are taking the lead on these different corridors. All agencies are involved on all corridors, but different agencies are stepping up to take that planning or project development lead. And that's a really neat thing to see um, in terms of the partnership of the work. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to David Kretzinger at the City of Denver. David, if you just want to present uh, from your seat, I can just do your slides. But wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of the specific projects, starting with East Colfax. Thanks, Jacob. Appreciate um, <clears throat> Dr. Cog's uh, regional facilitation here, bringing us all together. Um, for those of you not familiar with the, the corridor map, uh, on the left is the downtown area in yellow. Um, where there are already existing dedicated bus lanes. So the Colfax BRT project will be adding some branding and uh, some minor uh, upgrades in the downtown area, but not making significant changes there. Then in the blue section, um, <clears throat> that will be the area where there will be center running bus rapid transit uh, businesses along the corridor. Ultimately said, uh, preserve our driveway and parking access and put the, put the BRT in the middle. And then as, uh, in the orange section, as we transition to um, the Aurora, Aurora section, Max here, and uh, Matt, Matt can uh, kick my shin under the table if I misstate anything for Aurora. Um, <clears throat> uh, Aurora's got a, a different um, st 
street network and no one-way couplets in, in that section of the overall roadway network. So um, the, the buses will largely uh, be running mixed flow traffic on the, on the side and Aurora's chosen a, a, a complement of different station designs uh, along, the, along their section. On to the next uh, slide. So this is a picture of, of the center running station. Um, Aurora has a couple of these on uh, in the side running section as well. Um, you get a sense for how that will, will operate. Um, they are near side stops so that the, uh, the buses come to stop um, or they have to make a, a little bit of a jog through the intersection to avoid the, uh, the station on the other side. Um, tried to uh, link everything, pedestrian, bicycle, um, and uh, parking uh, maintained on the side, as I noted before. I don't remember if there's one more slide. Um, oh yeah, project schedule. So we've been been working pretty hard um, for a handful of years on our NEPA. Um, our environmental clearance was completed earlier this year, uh, and we are final stages of of getting our small starts grant. We expect to go to construction in October this year. Uh, notice to proceed for our construction contractor in September, but the public won't see a, a shovel in the ground till October. It takes a month or so for mobilization. So right now we're focusing this summer on a lot of communication with businesses, residents along the corridor, led by our um, Department of Economic Development and Opportunity, or DEDO, um, to provide um, information about um, getting folks into the construction careers um, if, if you're a construction-oriented person or business, uh, other marketing support for businesses along the corridors, Innovation Hub, which is kind of a support for entrepreneurs and more desk-oriented jobs, small business loans. And then if you're not a business, we have a neighborhood stabilization program for the Quebec to Yosemite section of Colfax. So doing a lot of that work to prepare people for construction, um, we think the construction phasing that the contractor has come up with will Minimize um, sort of the pain. There will be a little bit of pain, um, but compared to some of the downtown stuff that you all have experienced, we're not going to be in front of people's businesses that long. We'll flip flop from one side of the street to the other, so it's not the whole street all at one time, and and move sort of progressively from west to the Broadway end, um, eastward. Um, so that's the the key points for for Colfax Bus Rapid Transit. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. Um, so I mentioned Federal Boulevard Bus Rapid Transit. Again, for transparency, this is a slide that I created, um, but based on information publicly available through the Federal BRT work. Um, this is sort of the next corridor in line after Colfax and um, Colorado 119, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, so as I mentioned before, the Federal Boulevard BRT project is in full kind of federal project development, the NEPA process, National Environmental uh, Policy Act. It would extend from the Wagon Road Park and Ride along 120th to Federal and then all the way down Federal to Dartmouth and then over to the Englewood Light Rail Station on uh, the D-Line. CDOT is the lead agency on this project, on this corridor, uh, with multiple project partners. Uh, many of you are here today. Um, as I said, currently in the preliminary design, engineering, and environmental review uh, process in this project, a lot of work um, is ongoing almost by the day um, on this project. Um, and just to sort of illustrate it, you know, I talked about network and the importance of network, um, and I think this project illustrates it well. As I indicate here on the slide, you know, think about this. This BRT corridor will connect with RTD's B line, the G line, the future 38th Avenue bus rapid transit, the W line, the future Alameda bus rapid transit line, and the D line. Like what a powerful, what a powerful connection, what a powerful project. Um, this is one of those near-term projects that first tranche of five BRT corridors in the regional transportation plan that will be open by 2030. I'm going to invite Phil Greenwald. I'll give you the same offer. You can stage your seat, but if you'd like to present this slide. That would probably take me just to go over. Um, thank you for having me in the, in the TAC. It's always good to be back at the TAC and see all the old friends and this too. We are talking about partnerships, and so one of the great things here is we have Alex Hydright and it's later here from um, City of Boulder and Boulder County. We've been working with them very closely on this project as well as with CDOT uh, and RTD. So there's a lot of groups that come together to make this work. Um, it's pretty critical to talk about it, not just in the terms of bus rapid transit also, that it's also the bikeway, commuter bikeway is a huge part of this um, um, project. 
and does a lot to link in all the different pieces of the BRT elements as well. There's also safety improvements, and we're doing a lot of things internally from each of the cities, Longmont and Boulder included, to do some very uh, key critical pieces of both safety, uh, bikeway, and getting the bus buses through quickly through our through our cores of our city. So there's there's a couple elements there. Let's see on this one. There's two routes that are shown. The orange route is kind of. Uh, so I'll start with the blue route, which really links the two downtowns, Longmont and Boulder, along that spine. That's the 119 corridor that you see in the middle there. So Boulder on the south, Longmont on the on the north there on the top, and um, those are the two places where we're doing some critical pieces in interior to make sure this works. One's the Kaufman Street project in Longmont, one's the 28th Street project in Boulder. Orange Line is also critical. It serves the west part of Longmont and also serves the CU Boulder campus. So it's that market. That's well, we do hope to extend this soon or someday, I guess in the next um, 10 years soon, uh, to be something that goes out to I-25 and serves the uh, Mustang and the mobility hub that's being built today. I should be open in the next couple of months, I believe. I'll look back at my CDOT friends and get some nods. So that's great. Um, we're planning, City of Longmont's planning to do, we've already got a partnership program with RTD and planning to do a micro transit extension out there. So we do want to serve that and then get the bus rapid transit service out there as well. You see, we've received some dollars from the raise grants, some, some significant dollars. We've basically put the dollars together from the state, county, and the two localities, but we didn't really have that federal match. And so raise the raise grant really provided that $25 million piece that really finished up the project as far as the funding sources. But of course, we need more. We talked about the bikeway. Uh, we'll have bus queue bypass lanes, um, other improvements in the corridor as well, including a lot of um, uh, overpass, underpass type facilities for that bike, bike corridor so that we can get to and from the corridor safely and through the corridor safely. So those are all good things that are happening. And, and then along with David's project on East Colfax, we do anticipate to start construction here in fall, and that's exciting for all of us. I think we're really excited to see this project go forward and then have the official bus rapid transit service start in 2027 officially. So thank you. Thank you, Phil. So just want to end um, talking a little bit about Dr. Cog's MPO role in this work. And in doing so, I absolutely don't want to minimize um, the partnership, a word I've repeated a lot in this presentation, um, and that I hope you take away from it. This really is um, has been a collaborative um, effort among multiple agencies. But since we're here, do you want to touch on Dr. Cog's MPO role? Uh, we have certainly, of course, played um, a leadership and collaboration role in the partnership and starting the partnership and maintaining the partnership. Um, the breakout groups, some of the technical work that I discussed previously, um, our staff has led two of those three breakout groups. Again, not a competition, but um, just you know, where we've tried to provide some value. Um, of course, I've talked about the defined BRT network in our regional transportation plan. Those are the official designations um, of uh, those bus rapid transit projects. Uh, we will be revisiting that when we um, undertake our major um, 2050 regional transportation plan update that will be starting uh, later this summer. Um, we have been helping to lead the development of a potential um, regional BRT partnership consultant scope of work. Um, again, that has been a collaborative effort, um, but we've tried to take a leadership role there. Uh, we have applied for a federal grant through the USDOT Build America Bureau. Uh, we're hoping to bring some dollars um, towards some expert consultant services to help us with some of the technical issues that I presented on, uh, particularly in terms of updating costs and coming up with an innovative funding and financing strategy. So I hope to hear on that grant in the next month or so. Please keep your fingers crossed for us. Um, and then um, through our corridor planning set aside in our transportation improvement program, uh, we have been, uh, we led and funded the First Steps Corridor Study uh, for Alameda, my colleague Nora Kern, um, who recently presented on that work. Uh, that will be a future BRT corridor. Through our transportation improvement program, we are funding or have funded other kind of corridor and project funding uh, work regarding um, other sort of stakeholder work on BRT projects. Um, and finally, uh, we will be leading and funding um, an alternatives analysis study for an extension of the East Colfax project in Aurora, um, extending the East Colfax project from I-225 at the R-Line 
um, to close to E470, uh, where Colfax ends. Dr. Cog will actually be leading the alternatives analysis study, uh, but we'll be doing that in close partnership with Matt Callison and his team at the city of Aurora, along with the two counties, since Colfax is the county line and CDOT and RTD. Um, that project we hope to kick off later this summer as well. So with that, that's all we have today, but happy to answer any questions. And again, thank you to the partners who are here um, and who helped me prepare and present um, on the work that we're doing on BRT. Thank you. Now, thank you, Jacob, for that very uh, good update on BRT. Any questions or comments from uh, anybody? Members? I just had more of a comment, I guess, I think, you know, in the region, especially Dr. Cog region, uh, all the partners, the state have been able to deliver some really big regional improvements over the last few decades. And I think this is a great example of really that same partnership moving us forward. And I think you really, Jacob, talked well about these are 11 projects, but it's all part of a big system being built and how we all work together. And a lot of great examples of that today that I think really speak to regional partnership and how we in the region build big things. And I'm excited to see that come in. And congratulations uh, to City of Denver for getting that project to construction. I remember being in some conversations many, many, many years ago where that uh, project started um, and also to uh, City of Longmont. Congratulations, that are really exciting projects and City of Boulder as well. So um, very exciting times to see these projects come into construction. Any other comments or questions? All right, thank you, Jacob. So with that, um, our agenda does not have any informational items on it today. Uh, so we move on to administrative items. And I believe we have uh, a, an advanced mobility partnership working group update from uh, Cam and Priest. Uh, thanks, Vice Chair. Uh, the AMP Working Group met uh, a month ago back in June for our bi-monthly meeting this year where we heard a few informational briefings, no action items were taken. They were mostly about microtransit efforts around the region. So those presentations included one from NETC, TMO, about their uh, Aero Shuttle, Lone Tree's Link on Demand, uh, RGD's Partnership Program, and Dr. Cog's ongoing microtransit study. That's all I have. All right, thank you, Carson. Always glad to hear about that Lone Tree link. So, um, yeah, no, so thank you for that update. And uh, any other comments or questions uh, from any members? All right. Well, with that, uh, if you did not get a chance to sign in the check-in sheet that went around, please make sure you do that or let Dr. Cog's staff know so we can have you in the record as attending the meeting. Thank you all for participating in person today in our meeting. Um, our next TAC meeting will be August 26th, um, and uh, we will now adjourn the meeting at, it looks like, 3.07 p.m. Thank you all.